All right, so I'm continuing on here in, a, in my little series of, on the core doctrines. We're going back to the fundamentals of our faith here as far as our, our fundamental Baptist this, uh, doctrines that we believe. We started off, of course, with salvation. Our salvation is just by grace through faith alone without any works. And then uh, last week, I preached on the King James Bible, the Word of God, and how important that was in regards to salvation and everything else. That is a core fundamental belief that we have. And now this morning, I'm going to be preaching to you about baptism. Baptism is another very core, solid belief. There's a lot of people out there that have all kinds of different beliefs about baptism, but this is a very simple and a fundamental belief that we have, and I'm going to be preaching and teaching about the doctrine of baptism this morning. So, of course, in Mark chapter 1, where we got started there, it's a long chapter, we're going to be focused on the first part of the chapter, where we're introduced to John the Baptist. Now, of course, baptism is a new doctrine. You know, the Word of God, that doctrine, that, that encompasses all time. God's Word being revealed unto people, you know, and the importance of it, and how every Word of God is pure and true. That is a truth that, that has gone throughout all time that everybody has, you know, every believer would agree with and, and say is important, as well as salvation by grace through faith. Salvation is something, whether you're in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's always been salvation by grace through faith. There's never been any other way to be saved. It's never been by the law. It's always been because people have believed in God. But baptism is something that has started in the New Testament. This was not going on in the Old Testament. People weren't getting baptized in the Old Testament. This is something that started and actually started with John the Baptist. So that's why we're starting here in Mark chapter 1. We're being introduced to John the Baptist baptizing people because before that, and I'm not sure if it was in, if it's in this chapter or not. Um, I think it's in one of the other accounts, maybe in Matthew, where the, where the Pharisees were asking him, saying, well, why, why are you baptizing people? They asked him, so well, wait, are you, are you the Christ? Or are you Elijah? Because the Bible prophesies the, the, the forecoming of Elijah before, before Jesus Christ comes. So they're saying, wait, if you're not Christ and if you're not Elijah, then why are you baptizing people? See, they were, they were expecting this, this event, this, you know, this man to come and prepare the way of the Lord to be Elijah and that they would be the one to have authority to be baptizing people. But John actually did come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Jesus revealed that, that he really was that, that, next, that coming of Elijah before Jesus Christ was on the scene. Even though John himself didn't real, maybe necessarily even realize that he was coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. But um, let's, look, let's look here a little bit at, at John the Baptist and what he's doing. It says, uh, so here's that, that quote from Isaiah, the, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That was John the Baptist's mission, to prepare the way of the Lord, to, to make the path straight, to get everything ready and set up and, and do the preaching and everything that needed to be, to be happening before Jesus Christ comes on the scene. Verse number four says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, I'm not going to get too involved in this this morning, but I'm probably going to I'm going to skip the order I have in here just to deal with this right up front. There's a lot of people that'll say, you know, well, see John the Baptist preached repentance and Jesus preached repentance, and they did. Absolutely. I mean, don't we see that right here? I mean, don't we see that, that it says John uh, did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins? Yes, of course he did. But the problem with, with the false doctrine that's going on today is what people define repentance as. People today will say, oh, a, a lot of people, not everybody, will say, oh, well, see, he was preaching repentance. That means you have to turn from all of your sins. And if you don't turn from all of your sins, then you're not saved. And that's a false doctrine. Now, look, it's real popular. And people will say, you know, it gets repeated over and over and over and over and over again in Baptist churches so that people don't even think about it. If you ask someone, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, you have to repent. You have to repent of your sins to be saved. And that just gets repeated and people don't even think about it. But if that were true, then that would mean you have to give up all of your sins. I mean, repenting from your sins would mean to turn from them. If, you, if I turn from my sins, you say, okay, I turn from all of my sins, the very next time I sinned, well, I didn't really turn from him now, did I? You say, well, I turned and went back. Well, what does that mean? You know, it doesn't make any sense. So you, you'd have to say, well, well then I'd have to live a perfect life in order to stay saved, in order to be saved, in order to prove that I truly did repent and turn from all of my sins. 
But we know that we're all sinners, and that doesn't make any sense. But I, I preach entire sermons regarding repentance. But just so that you can see, keep your finger here in Mark 1. Turn, if you would, to... Um, Wow, did I complete? No, X, uh, X 19. No, that's not it. I'm sorry, X 10. No. Why do I not? I don't have the reference in here. All right, well, we're going to skip it then. It got deleted from my notes. All right, we're going to skip that. <clears throat> Basically, in the, in the verse, I don't have it memorized right now, and of course, I'm under a little bit more pressure to, to, to remember the verse. There's, um, in, in, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says that uh, John was preaching the baptism of repentance and saying that you must, be and saying that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And that is, man, I should have kept that in my notes. I don't know how I lost it. It's later in the book of Acts. Well, regardless, I'm not going to spend any more time on that. John preaching and teaching the repentance of, uh, the baptism of repentance. Repentance is just a change of mind. The word repent is just to, you know, to turn or to change, but it's not in context. It doesn't always have to deal with sin. Now, sometimes when the word repent is used in the context of the scripture, it is talking about sin. It's talking about, about you know, turning from a you know, specific sin or something like that, but it always has to, you always have to read it in context and see what it's saying. So if it's not referring to sin, you can't just assume that it's talking about sin. Because the word repent itself, it just means to rethink. You're thinking again. You're changing something. You're changing. Now, in order to be saved, as far as salvation goes, it's talking about changing what you believe. Literally. Because if the requirement to be saved, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If that's the requirement for salvation, which is so clear and so evident throughout Scripture, is that you need to believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation, then the repentance that's necessary is the change in your belief. I go out, we go out so we talk to people all the time and we ask them the question why they think they're going to heaven. If they say, yeah, I'm going to heaven when I die, why? 99% of people will say, because I'm a good person or something to that effect. Something to the effect of, well, I'm not that bad. You know, I mean, I've never killed anybody. I'm a pretty good person. I help people out. I go to church. I pray. I do this. I do that. You know, I have all these things that, that they do. And that belief that they're somehow good enough to make their way into heaven or they haven't been bad enough to deserve hell, that belief needs to change. In order to be saved, that belief has to change. They have to repent. They have to change what they believe and realize that no, they actually do deserve hell. Because they have sinned and any of the sins that they've done are worthy of hell. They have to change and believe that. They have to understand that. Look, God is a God of judgment. And that even though if I compared myself to other people, I might seem pretty good, in God's eyes, I fall way short. They have to understand that. And they also have to understand that is that no matter how many good things I do, it's not going to be good enough in order to earn my position in heaven because I've already done bad and those sins need to be paid for. So they need to receive that free gift of salvation. That is the repentance that's necessary. You have to realize, come to that point where you say, I, I can't do this. I'm lost. I need to be saved. I need somebody else to save me. I need Jesus Christ to save me. That is the repentance that's necessary for salvation. And keep that in mind. You know, when you read the Bible, because a lot of people tell you, oh, repent of your sins, repent of your sins. Or, no. Only in the context. If it's talking about sins, then yes, that's what it's talking about. But I'll tell you what, in the context when it's talking about sin, it's never talking about salvation. When you say, what should we do? Hey, as Christians, should you repent of your sins? Absolutely you should. Should I be repenting of my sins? Yes, I should be repenting of my sins daily. 
I should be completely turning from my sins and not doing those things. But that has nothing to do with whether or not I'm saved. So if you see the Bible talking about, you know, repenting, it's talking about sin and wickedness. It's not talking about your eternal salvation, but it is something that we should be doing. So here we see John the Baptist. So we'll get back into baptism. I don't want to get, uh, I'm getting too far off on these, on these other topics anyways. That, I think that's why I removed it out of the notes because I didn't want to go too in-depth about that. I have entire sermons just based on the whole repentance doctrine where we go through all the times the word repent is used and just prove it from Scripture that, that salvation is totally by grace and has nothing to do with giving up your sins. But let's get back in here because John the Baptist, he's out in the wilderness He's kind of a rough guy. He's eating locusts, you know, the bugs, and he's eating wild honey. I mean, he's just out, out doing his thing, and he's preaching, and he's not this, this you know, smooth-looking guy. He's not this real, you know, suave, you know, these preachers that have all their teeth lined up and perfectly wide, and they're, like, glowing and how well they look. John the Baptist was, was kind of a man's man, right? It says he was out in the wilderness, he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He says, it says uh, in verse 6, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. So he had a leather belt. That's what, you know, a girdle is just basically a belt. He's got this belt about his loins. He's got a leather belt. He's wearing camel skin. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he was just out there preaching, right? Because what he looked like doesn't really matter. The message is what was important. He didn't have to be polished up and shined up for everybody to look at. He was out preaching. And Jesus Christ himself said, you know, what went you out for in the wilderness to see? He said, are you a reed shaken with the wind? What went you out for to see? And he said that, you know, they that wear, um, you know, fancy clothing, basically, you know, belong in king's palaces. But John the Baptist was a man of God. He said, among, among them that are born of women, there is not uh, greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But um, he was giving a lot of credit and a lot of honor. Jesus Christ himself was giving a lot of credit and honor unto John the Baptist of being a righteous man, a man of God, someone who wasn't afraid to preach and tell the truth. And, um, you know, you don't have to look at how... Because the Pharisees of the time, they were the ones that liked to wear the fancy clothing. They liked to be in the uppermost room at the feasts and get all the accolades and have everybody look up to them and put them up on this pedestal. And that's what they loved. They loved themselves. They loved that. They had that pride. And that's what they cared about. John the Baptist didn't care about any of that stuff. And we shouldn't either. We should care just about hearing the truth. Here's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's just out. He's by himself, but he's preaching the word of God. And you know what? People respond to the truth. They want, a lot of people, they want to hear the truth. They want to know just what's right. And you can see through the facade of the Pharisees and just say, you know what? They're phonies. They're fake. What they're saying is they're just trying to please me. Well, I don't want to just hear something that's going to please me. I want to just hear the truth. And John the Baptist was a man that was out there and preaching the truth. And it says, um, And there went out unto him, in verse 5, All the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So they went out, they heard him preach, and then they, and people were starting to get baptized. He was starting to baptize a lot of people. And they were in the river of Jordan. Now, the, point, well, the first point I want to make is that... Um, you know, we believe in baptism. Baptism is by immersion. You completely go under the water to be baptized. There's people out there that think that baptism is just a sprinkling, just, just taking a little bit of water and doing one of these, that that's baptism. And there's other people that, that say, oh, well, all you have to do is just pour some water over their head. No, we could see clearly from Scripture that baptism is immersion. And just knowing where the word baptism comes from, baptiz uh, being baptized or baptism is a word that's transliterated. So it's a word that didn't normally exist in English, but they kept the same word from the Greek into English. So I don't believe that we have to go back to the Greek to understand the Bible and all these things. But there's a few words that are, that are, that are kept over that didn't exist really in the English language, but they were transliterated, which means they were, they were made a word in English to, and they retained the same meaning that they had in the, in the other language that they were translated from. So in the Greek, you know, the Greek people know that, that baptism means being immersed. It's, it's completely surrounded and immersed. And 
that's one of the reasons why the, you have the Greek Orthodox Church is split from the Catholic Church because, I mean, the Greek people know what that word baptism even means because the Catholic Church, they think baptism is sprinkling and they baptize babies and they sprinkle them. Where I think the Greek Orthodox Church still baptizes babies, but they dunk them under the water. Just because, I mean, that's one of the things. Obviously, they split for probably a, a, lot, of, a lot of different reasons. But that one um, was a big one and they know just because they're Greeks, they're not going to be fooled on what the word baptism means, or bautizo in their, in their, in their language. But um, we believe that baptism, and, and it could be easily proved from Scripture that um, you know, here we see they're in the River Jordan. They went into the water. It says when Jesus came up out of the water, then the, the you know, heaven opened up and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And you know, they were in the water. The, the baptizing they were doing, it says in, uh, in I think, John chapter 3, they were baptizing in Enon because there was much water there. If you're just doing sprinkling, if you're just doing some pouring, why would it matter if there's a lot of water there? You don't need a lot of water to be doing pouring. You don't need a lot of water to be doing sprinkling. You do need a lot of water to be dunking people under the water and bringing them back up again. So baptism is completely by immersion. And there's a lot of symbolism behind that. I'm going to get into symbolism later on in the sermon. But um, the whole, the whole symboliz symbolizing of, of what baptism even means is, um, is important as far as going completely immersed in the water. So here in Mark chapter 1, John the Baptist, he's out there, he's preaching about baptism, and people are getting baptized. Now we see all throughout the New Testament, new converts are being baptized. It's something that is important, it's something that's happening. And even Jesus himself was baptized. Now baptism is a command. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 28. Just, just Actually, you probably don't even have to turn, depending on how your Bible is set up. If you're in Mark chapter 1, Matthew 28 is the, is the last chapter of Matthew. And this is when he's giving that great commission. Right? Jesus Christ says in verse 19 of Matthew 28, Go ye therefore... He's commanding them. He's sending out his disciples. He's sending them out. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That is a command from Jesus Christ. He's saying, go. He's not saying, eh, if you want to. He says, no, go. Go therefore and teach all nations. This is your job. This is what I'm sending you to do baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, you need to go and do this. You need to baptize people. And this is something that we do. And it's, it's a command. It's something that Jesus commanded them to do. It's what we're commanded to do. We need to go out and get people saved and get them baptized. And in Acts chapter 10, there's another reference to a command of being baptized. Acts 10 verse 47, the Bible says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Baptism is not just something you do just for fun or something we do just based on tradition because, oh, well, that's what people have been doing. It's actually a command of God. And I believe if you're saved and you have not been baptized that you're in sin because of the fact that it is a commandment. This is something that Jesus Christ has commanded us to do, you know, has commanded his disciples to do is to go out, hey, get people saved, yes, but get them baptized and teach them. It's making disciples of people. Now, there's a lot of lies out there regarding baptism and what it does. And one of the big ones I want to cover this morning is just that baptism is not salvation. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Because this is a, a, a pet verse that the Pentecostals will like to take you to. Acts chapter 2. And you'll run into this when you, when you try to preach the gospel to people. You run into someone that believes that, you know, you, every once in a while you ask someone, well, you know, do you know for sure if you die today, you're saved, you're going to heaven? They say, yes. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I believe and I've been baptized. And I say, well, wait a minute. So do you have to be baptized to be saved? Absolutely, yes. You have to be baptized to be saved. And there's people out there that believe you have to be baptized. If you're not baptized, you're not saved. And that's just adding works to salvation. So they'll take you to Acts chapter 2 is one of the places that want to prove that to you and say, oh, yeah, no, the Bible says you have to be baptized to be saved. Mark 16 is another place, but um, I've covered that many times in the past. Mark 16 just says, whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But the way that it's worded makes perfect sense because 
Whosoever believeth and comes to church shall be saved. Whosoever believeth and does anything shall be saved because it's the believing that makes you saved. And, and then it says, and, but whosoever believeth not shall be condemned. So like, it doesn't say whosoever believeth not and is not baptized, or whosoever believeth and is not baptized is condemned. It says whosoever believeth not. So the, the belief is the, is the determining factor between, between being saved and not being saved. But here we are in, in Acts chapter 2. And what they'll try to do is try to bring you to Acts 2.38. But you can always just say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's jump up a little bit before Acts 2.38. Let's look at Acts 2.21. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so right there you have people calling on the name of the Lord. And of course, Romans chapter 10 says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How they should believe in him? And we go through that, that whole um, line of, of how you could even call on the name of the Lord. It's Yeah, it's by believing. And again, it boils down to faith, just like every other place in the Bible. It all makes sense and it all goes together. But let's start reading in verse number 36. We'll go into the, to where they want to try to prove, you know, baptism is required for salvation. Verse number 36, the Bible reads, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter's there. He's preaching Jesus. These people there, like the Jews are there that, that had Jesus crucified. You know, people are yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus, or Peter, is explaining. He says, look, this same Jesus that ye've crucified, God made him Christ. He is the Lord. And now they're starting to get pricked. They're saying, in their heart, they're saying, oh, man, you know, they're starting to think about what they did. And they're saying, wow. You know, what should, well, what should we do? And notice, it doesn't say, what must I do to be saved, like it says in Acts 16, verses 30, verse 30. He says, it says, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Well, if someone asks me, what should I do? Right? If I want to get right with God, what should I do? Well, if you're not saved, you should get saved. You should get baptized. You should get in church. And you should stop sinning. And you should live for God, right? If you're going to ask me, what should I do? Hey, those are all things you should do. It doesn't mean that when someone says, what should I do, that, that I'm only answering in, re in response to what do I have to do in order to be saved. So the question is, well, what shall we do? Verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the misinterpretation and misunderstanding that they have in this verse is, is twofold. One, they'll usually think that repent means repent of sins. Now, this doesn't say anything about sins in this, in this verse. He says repent. And the repentance that's necessary is they didn't receive Christ as Savior before because they had Him crucified. They need to repent. They need to receive Christ as their Savior. That's, that's it. And look, you need to get saved. You need to repent of what you believe, believe on Christ, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with this verse. There's nothing saying that you have to be baptized to be saved. But here's where they say, well, no, no, it says for the remission of sins. They're saying you need to be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, that's just a lack of understanding of the English language. Today we use that word for in this, you know, in this context, you might say they're thinking of um, in order to have remission of sins. That's how they're interpreting that word for. But that's not what that word for means. And, and I don't want to make this real difficult or confusing, but think about in the Old West, you'd have a wanted sign, right? You'd have a criminal, an outlaw. You'd have sometimes a sketch of their face on the sign. And what would it say? Wanted for murder. Now, the wanted for murder sign, is that like a classified ad saying, I want somebody to, to hire in order to murder somebody else? Is that what that word for means? I want, you know, this person's wanted in order to murder. That's not what that means. Wanted for murder, that word for means because of. Right? Because of. Wanted for murder means this person's wanted because of murder, because they murdered somebody. So that word for just means because of. 
And if we take that understanding of that word here when we read this, he says, Then Peter said unto them, Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. Not in order to have your sins remitted, in order to have your sins forgiven. It's because you have been forgiven. That's why we get baptized. We get baptized because we've been forgiven of our sins. And we'll get into, again, we're going to get into that later in the sermon. In Romans chapter 6, it explains how we should be walking in newness of life. Hey, when we get buried in baptism, we die to our old self. We die to those sins. Those sins are left behind, and then we get in newness of life. We, we come up, we are, we are showing a resurrection. It's a new life. It's a new birth. That's why we get baptized. The, baptized, the baptism symbolizes that. That new life. We get baptized to show, look, I was dead in my sins. But I'm going to leave those sins there. Jesus Christ has nailed them to the cross. I've received Christ as my Savior. I've repented of what I believed. I believe Jesus is the Christ now. He's my Savior. So now I'm going to get baptized because I've been forgiven. Because my sins have been remitted. That's all this verse means. It's not confusing. But see, when people try to tell you, what, what happens is they get this thought in your mind of saying, no, no, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Now you start looking. When you already have that thought in your mind, you start trying to look, you look at this verse in a different way. So you, you got to be careful not to let people really mess your mind up around this verse of trying to say that, oh, yeah, when it says, in the name of Jesus, you know, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Thinking, wow, that says right there that I need to be baptized in order to have my sins remitted. That's not what that means. Just understanding what the word for means. It's real simple. But people can lead you down these, these wrong paths because they'll, they'll insert that false doctrine into your mind and then you start seeing things the way that they see it, but it's, it's false. It's not true. And I, I believe I've proved it amply that that word for doesn't mean in order to get the, the remission of sins. And you shall receive the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, uh, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, and here we start to see that, uh, you know, people are getting baptized after they believe which is exactly what Acts 8.37 teaches. When, when Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, saying, you know, well, here's a bunch of water. He pre Philip's preaching unto him, Jesus Christ, as they're traveling on their way. And, and the, the eunuch stops him. He says, well, wait, here's, here's some water right here. Why can't I be baptized? And of course, in all the modern versions, that verse is gone, that, that Philip answers him, saying, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Kind of an important verse. That, that Philip explains the only way you can get baptized is if you believe. You have to believe first. The belief has to be there because you have to be saved in order to symbolize what, the, what you're even doing with the baptism. But um, turn, if you would, to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because this is even better. I, I've tried to go through and explain Acts 2.38 to these people who, who want to cling to that and say, well, no, you must be baptized in order to be saved. And, and more often than not, it just goes right over their head trying to explain what the word for means. And I use my example of, you know, wanted for murder and stuff like that. But I haven't had very good success trying to explain that to them. Because obviously, I mean, look, we want people to get saved. It's not like I'm trying to prove that I'm right just because I'm right. I'm trying to win an argument and, oh, man, I want to shut you down. No, I want to get these people that believe that to, to, change, to repent, to change what they believe so that they could get saved. Because when you add a little bit of works to, to what you believe, it's all works. It's a works-based salvation, and nobody is saved with a belief that has works involved in their salvation. It has to be completely free or else you're not saved. And people that believe you have to be baptized in order to be saved are not saved. You're adding works unto the grace of God. It's no longer grace. It has become works. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see here the Apostle Paul. I mean, think about it. The, the doctrine that says you have to be baptized in order to be saved is so easily disproven. I mean, for one, you could just go to the thief on the cross. Remember when Jesus was crucified, there was a thief on either side of him. And they were railing on him. But then one of the thieves said, you know what? You know, like, like 
we're in this condemnation because of what we've done, but this guy didn't do anything wrong. And then he, said, he called on Jesus and said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He says, I want, you know, think about, remember me. And basically what he was doing, he was calling on Jesus for his salvation. He was, and he didn't have to use any fancy words. Maybe he didn't use the perfect words, but it doesn't matter because in his heart he believed on him and he called out to Jesus Christ and he got saved. And that's what Jesus Christ said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, if he had to be baptized in order to be saved, well, then how can Jesus say, this day you're going to be with me in paradise? Because he didn't get baptized when he was up on that cross, I'll tell you what, and he didn't believe on Jesus until he was already on the cross. It's evident because the, there's, there's, when you look at all the accounts in the Gospels, in one account, he's, he's railing on Jesus with the other thief. They're both laying into him, but later on, he changes his mind. He repents. He stops laying into him and says, you know what? This guy didn't do anything wrong. And good for him for, for doing that right before he died. I mean, literally, the guy was, was, was being executed. And even him, you know, at the end of his life, he put his faith on Jesus Christ and he was saved. But he didn't get baptized. It's a perfect example. Of, I mean, it's impossible for him to get baptized. He was not baptized. But look at what Paul says. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, if baptism, and see what the people say about the thief and the cross, they say, oh, no, 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 no. You didn't have to be baptized until after Jesus' resurrection. Now, all of a sudden, baptism was required for salvation. They have all these different time periods for what, you know, what's required for salvation, which is stupid in and of itself. But, okay, when the Apostle Paul is writing his letter to the Corinthians, this is well after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This would be in that time period of if, you know, if they're going to try to use that excuse, oh, well, it's, it's only after his resurrection. Okay, well, then why did the Apostle Paul say, for Christ sent me not to baptize? Doesn't Christ want people getting saved? For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He wasn't sent to baptize. He says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. His job was to preach the gospel. How can he say that through the Holy, the Holy Ghost? I mean, this is Scripture. It's not just his opinion. This is, this, is, this is the Holy Man of God speaking as he's moved by the Holy Ghost, being recorded in Scripture, saying that God didn't send me to baptize. Well, if he didn't send you to baptize, then how is it that people are getting saved by you, Apostle Paul, if baptism is required for salvation? Because it's not. Because he's preaching the gospel because it's the gospel that is what saves Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. You know, I mentioned earlier that I think it's, I believe it's a sin to not get baptized. If you're already saved and you've never been baptized, I think that's a sin. People need to get baptized. For one, we saw that it was commanded. We saw Jesus Christ commanded. We see that, that it was commanded in, um, in the book of Acts as well. He commanded that they be baptized. But look at Luke chapter 7. Verse number 28, Luke 7, verse 28. This is where Jesus Christ is, is um, you know, giving a little bit of respect unto John the Baptist for, for being such a great man of God. Luke 7, 28, the Bible reads, For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of, John, of God is greater than he. Verse 29, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified, justified God being baptized with the baptism of, of John. So they're getting baptized. It says they justified God. They made God righteous and just in their getting baptized. But look at verse number 30. It says, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So these people who, the Pharisees and the lawyers that were not baptized by John the Baptist, they, were, they were, did not get baptized, they rejected the counsel of God. So I would say to the Christian, you're saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, but you're not getting baptized, you're rejecting the counsel of God. 
You may not realize it, but that's exactly what you're doing. I mean, this is what the Scripture is teaching, is that if you get baptized, you're justifying God, and if you're not getting baptized, you're rejecting the counsel of God. That's what he brings up between those that did get baptized and those that didn't. They're justifying God or they're rejecting the counsel of God. It is important. I mean, we are Baptist, right? This is Word of Truth, Baptist Church. Baptism is important. We need to get people saved, but we need to get them baptized. Now, on the topic of, uh, of getting rebaptized, see, some people will say, oh, well, I was baptized as an infant, as I was. I was, I was sprinkled as a baby, right? I wasn't really baptized, but I was sprinkled. You know, some people say, oh, well, I was already baptized, so I don't need to get baptized. Well, here's the thing. If you, if you got baptized prior to your belief on Christ and prior to accepting Christ, you need to get baptized again because, no, and I don't care. I mean, there are people that I've met that have been baptized five times because they've gone from one religion to the next. They were seeking God and they, were, you know, they would go to one church for a while and they'd say, oh no, you need to get baptized here, okay. You know, they go to the Mormon church for a while and say, no, no, you need to get baptized here, okay, so they get baptized here. And they go, to, you know, and they, they go down the line, but nowhere along the line did they really get saved, did they really receive Christ as their Savior because they were going to all these different churches that believed in a works-based salvation. And then they finally realized, oh man, you know, this is great. You know, salvation's a free gift and they receive Christ. Well, you can't stop and just be like, well, well, I've already been, I mean, I was baptized five times. I don't need to get baptized again. You do. Because the baptism that counts is the one that comes after you believe, after you've received Christ as your Savior. That is the one that God is looking for as being the legitimate baptism that, you, that you've received. Every other time, you've just been getting wet. I mean, I've taken lots of baths in my life, but those aren't baptisms, Right? I've gone swimming a bunch of times. Those weren't baptisms. Okay, the baptism comes after you get saved. Um, in Acts chapter 19, I'll just I'll read this for you. Turn if you would to um, turn if you would to Romans 6. Romans 6 will be the last place I have you turn. Romans 6. There is a story of people getting rebaptized in the Bible. And I'll read it for you. It's, it's found in Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 1, the Bible reads, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Oh, here, and this is the verse I was looking for. It is in my notes. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. He explains it to them. See, these people, they got baptized to, according to John's baptism, but they didn't understand the message. They came to him, they got baptized, they thought they were doing what was right and they got baptized. They didn't get what he was saying because they didn't, they didn't receive the gift of Christ, the, 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 the free gift. And they're like, I don't even know whether it would be a Holy Ghost. I don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, well, what were you baptized unto? He said, well, John's repentance, you know, because a lot of people were coming to John. A lot of people were getting baptized. It only makes sense that some of them didn't quite get it, but they still got baptized. I mean, I try to make sure when we baptize people that, that they're believing right, that they, they are saved. But, I mean, I can't see the heart. People can say things. They can repeat things. I mean, they could repeat what John was just saying, but it doesn't mean that they believed it in their heart or that they understood the gospel, right? You can, you can repeat things and just say, okay, well, you assume that they're saved because they've, they said it. But, it, you know, if it's not in their heart, if they didn't put their faith on Christ, then they didn't get saved. And see, Paul explains what John was preaching. He says, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And as I was explaining earlier, the baptism of repentance, he says it's saying unto the people. This is the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. That's the baptism of repentance, that you believe on Christ Jesus. It says, when they heard this, oh, oh, that's what he was saying, that we just have to believe on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, they were already baptized before, but they weren't saved. They didn't get it. They needed to get baptized again after they got saved. So then 
You know, this is a perfect example of that happening. And if you've been going to churches, maybe you've been baptized before, if it was prior to your belief on Christ, then just get baptized again. Here's the thing. There is no harm ever in getting baptized again. There's no harm in that. So if you have any question or doubt or think, you know what, I'm not quite sure if I was saved when, you know, like when I got baptized. I know I'm saved now because I know, you know, I mean, obviously I know salvation is a free gift. I know it's now, but at the time I got baptized, I don't quite know if I was saved. If you have any doubts or questions about that, just get baptized again. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not hurting anything. You're not doing, you know, it's that there should be no shame involved in that. Just try to do what's right. And obviously, if you know that you were baptized after you believed, then great. I mean, amen, praise the Lord. Then you, you did that, that step of obedience that God is requiring us to do. Now, um, you're in Romans chapter 6. I'm going to go into to some, some more of the symbolism behind baptism. Romans 6 is a great chapter explaining baptism. And we'll just one more point on John the Baptist when it says, we read this already in Mark 1. So John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. The I love those words together. Baptism of repentance. Because what's baptism? It's, it's, it's a total immersion, right? It's this, this total surrounding and being, you know, like, like we think in water, you're being dunked underwater. But this baptism of repentance, you're wholeheartedly accepting Christ. You know, you're, you're being baptized in this repentance of, of Christ. And that's why, you know, if someone says they believe in Jesus, but like they're clinging to their, to their false religion, say, well, I want to believe on Jesus, but I'm, you know, I, I want to keep doing this or doing that and going to the Catholic Church and going to, you know, it's like, no. The baptism of repentance means you are giving up your old religion or your old thoughts and beliefs on what you think salvation is. And you are completely accepting Christ with all of your heart. It's a, it's a full acceptance of Christ. And that's symbolized with the physical baptism in water. It's a baptism of repentance. Your life changes when you put your faith in Christ. It should. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect and not commit sin afterwards. But it is a life-changing thing because it's a new life. It is a new life. When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a new creature that's born inside of you. You are born of God. You have a spirit that's born of God inside of you. That is life-changing. And totally relying on Jesus Christ for your salvation, that is life-changing. And that is what the baptism of repentance is all about. But let's start reading in Romans 6. We're going to read through the vast majority of this chapter because it's dealing with baptism, and then we'll be done. We're almost done with the sermon. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, verse number 1, the Bible reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, at the end of Romans 5, he just got done explaining that, you know, where, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You know, whenever there's sin, hey, grace covers that. So giving us the, the, the understanding that no matter how much I sin, grace is covering my sin. That's where we have eternal security. We are secure in the fact that Jesus Christ and what he did is enough to pay for all of our sins because the obedience of one you know, basically paid for the sins of many. And that's what Romans 5 describes. But now after going into all that detail about how all of our sins are forgiven, in Romans 6, the question is asked, well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, should we just keep sinning then? I mean, why not? Grace is going to keep covering it. God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're dead to sin. Look, we've been saved. Our sins are, are covered. We should be dead to sin. We have a new life, a new creature that's inside of us. How shall we live any longer therein? Know ye not, verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The baptism symbolizes when you get dunked under that water, when you get baptized, 
and the, and the preacher is putting you under the water, that symbolizes the death and burial of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was on the cross. He bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. When he died and was buried, he's burying those sins. He's taking those sins and burying them and getting rid of them and getting them out of the way so that they don't have that, that, that curse on our life anymore. The curse of hell. He's paid it. He buries them. When we get baptized, we're, we're demonstrating, we're showing a picture of that burial and the death to the sin. And then it says, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Obviously, we don't stay under the water. <laughs> Otherwise, you drown. You get dunked under the water, but then you come right back up again, right? And then you stand up. That's the newness of life. That's the resurrection. So you show that burial, but then, hey, you come right back up again. You're resurrected from the dead. And now it's showing a newness of life. And of course, with the water, there's still a symbolism of a cleansing, Right? I mean, we use water to get clean. So you go into that water, so to speak, dirty. Before you get, you know, the baptizer is showing you, you know, when you get in that water, your old man, your sins, hey, you're dying to that old man. You're getting put under the water. You come up clean. So we should walk in newness of life. We should be walking in that new man, cleansed. No more going back to the dirt and the filth of the sin of this world, but walking in that newness in the newness of the Spirit and doing the things that are right, doing the things that are pleasing to God. We should do those things. Now notice it doesn't say, you know, we get, but you will do those things or you must do those things. You should. You should. The wording is always important in the Bible, which is why it's so important to have the right Bible because you need the right wording to understand exactly what it means. One little word being changed, should to must, makes a huge difference in doctrine and everything else. No, you should walk in newness of life. Absolutely. Does that mean we always will all the time? No, but we should. Let's keep reading. Um, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from here forward, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. And praise the Lord for that. The baptism symbolizes our death to that old self. Hey, we have eternal life. It's everlasting life. We're never going to die. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, is what Jesus Christ said. Believest thou this? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're never going to die. You're never going to return. You know, we get buried with Christ. Christ died and paid for our sins. We're buried with him in that baptism. No longer to return to that again. Praise the Lord, that, that, that everlasting gift. Verse number 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, so in the same manner that he did that, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, I don't know, the, I don't, I don't know exactly who here has been baptized and who hasn't, but assuming that everybody in here that's saved has already been baptized, you say, well, wait a minute, why, I already know I've already been baptized. What does this sermon have to do with me? Well, I'll tell you what this sermon should have to do with you. It's say, okay, first of all, it's an important doctrine to understand anyways, and that we should have that learned. But you say, you know what? I'm already solid on this. I'm already found on this. Hey, if you're saved and you've already been baptized, let this be a reminder of you that you should be walking in newness of life, that you shouldn't return to the old lust, the, fle the, the lust of the flesh again, and that you need to be walking in newness of life. Hey, be dead to that sin. And maybe you need to take today as a day to say, you know what? I'm going to put that stuff back again. You know, since I've been baptized, I've gone back into sin. I've kind of returned. And, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in newness of life today. 
I'm going to die to that old self again today. I'm going to put it away. I'm going to get the sin out of my life. And not only am I going to get the sin out of my life, I'm going to walk in newness of life, which means I'm going to be doing what's right and what's good in the sight of God. Not just getting rid of some sins, but I'm going to be moving forward in the, in the life of a new man, of a new creature. Doing what's right in the, in the sight of God. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. We have mortal bodies. He's saying, don't let sin dictate your life. Because sin will bring you into bondage, guaranteed. Any sin that you get into, it's, it rules your life. Don't be ruled over by that sin that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. You know, people that think, oh, well, I'm saved, so who cares? Whatever, I'm just going to sin. I mean, I'm, I'm already saved. It's not like I'm going to go to hell now. God forbid that you should have that type of an attitude or that type of a thought. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? So you have the choice. You're the one that's yielding. You could yield, which means allow, right? You could allow your flesh to win. When your flesh is trying to tempt you and, 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 and lead you into these desires of, of you know, drinking or fornication or what, whatever, whatever your flesh is trying to lead you to do at whatever given time, you have the power to yield unto that and allow that to happen and just say, okay, I'm going to allow this sin to take place. You also have the power to not allow that to happen. If you yield yourself unto that sin, you're going to be a servant to that sin. So you say, if you, you allow that to, ha to happen, you, you yield yourself, you're going to be a servant. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. He's saying you could yield yourself unto doing the right thing, unto being obedient unto God. And then you'll be a servant of God, which I'd much rather be a servant of God than a servant of sin. But God be thanked that ye were the, ser ye were the servants of sin. Past tense, you were the word servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. If you've already been baptized, take this sermon today as, as a point to just say, you know what, I'm going to walk in newness of life today. I'm going to do what's right today. I'm going to, I'm going to get the sins out of my life. You know, I'm going to show that, that I really do care about the, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself made. Because the more you get into sin, just think, those are that many more sins that Jesus Christ paid for. The Son of God. The Lamb of God, the perfect one. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I know He's already done it. But we live in, in time. We're bound by time. You know, we're, Jesus Christ, God is outside of time. We are bound by time. The more you sin, it's like you're adding that to the cross of Jesus. It's like, here, let me throw one more sin on your shoulders there, Jesus. Just picture him on the cross and suffering and bleeding and dying. When he bare our sins, every time we decide to, to just say, you know what? This feels good. I'm just going to do it. You're heaping your sin and just throwing it on Jesus Christ every time you do that. We need to keep that in mind. You, just, you, know, when you, think, you think that, oh, I'm only affecting myself. You know, okay, I'm going to sin, but God's going to come down. He's going to punish me, fine, whatever, but I really want to do this thing. You're doing more than that. You always are. It's, it's, you know, we always try to justify sin in our mind, but keep that in mind. Even though he's already paid for it, you, you know, while we continue to sin, we're just heaping all of that sin on Jesus Christ and making him pay for, for 
so much the more. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the great gift of salvation, dear Lord. We thank you for um, all the teachings that you've given us in the Bible and how clear they are, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us to, to main, um, maintain our steadfastness in the faith, dear Lord, and, and um, that you would help us to walk in newness of life, that, that daily, Lord, we would be making this decision to die to self and to live for you and to, and to remember our baptism, to remember your death, burial, and resurrection, dear Lord, that is symbolized in, in baptism. And God, if there's anyone here that hasn't been baptized after they believed, dear Lord, I pray that you please just speak to their heart and that they would, um, they would get baptized soon. And if everyone has been baptized, Lord, I pray that you please just help us all to, to walk in that newness of life and to not be forgetful of the baptism that we've already um, professed and that, and that we've done to show that, that we are dead to our sins and that we're going to walk in newness of life, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.